Jessica LaRusso from Workplace Education Manitoba, and I'm your host and support today for customer service. Before I introduce our uh, instructor today, I'd like to bring your attention to some uh, troubleshooting and some support and interaction tools that we have available for you. At the top of your screen, you'll see uh, three um, icons. One is a smile emoji, a blue box with a question mark in it, and a telephone. The smile emoji will open up a variety of expressions, such as thumbs up, thumbs down, smile, sad face. And your instructor may ask you uh, to use that from time to time for feedback and interaction. As well as there is a blue box with a question mark in it. And that is where you're going to uh, input any questions that you may have that the instructor will answer at the end of the webinar. And also the instructor may uh, prompt you to uh, answer any private comments or statements as well. The uh, third icon is a telephone emoji that uh, if you need to switch to the telephone, you are welcome to. Lastly, there is an option for you to interact via chat. Now in the chat box, you'll see two links that include uh, two support links. So if you need extra help, they're there for you. As well as, as I have included my email address, which is j. L-O-R-U-S-S-O at WEM, W-E-M dot M-B dot C-A. So if you have any questions or any technical support, I will be checking my email uh, often during the webinar. As well, I have my text for the people who are on the telephone today, which is 204-770-4864. So if you have any questions or uh, need support, I'm there for you. Please text me. Next. Uh, there is a uh, download for a PDF, and it's a handout uh, um, workbook uh, for this session. Now, you don't have to download it specifically for this session, but what I'd like you to do right now is to click on that link and download it onto your computer so that you have it available after the webinar. And lastly, in the chat area, there is a link to a JOT form. Now this is a, a specific form to get your pre-assessment um, feedback. So right now what I'd like you to do is to click on that particular form. Of course I'll wait for you. There's just a um, brief amount of questions and please answer them. We'll wait. I will have the information on my telephone and watch um, because we need your information so that we can offer more value to the workshop. So right now just do that and I'll be checking on um, on uh, whether you've completed it or not. So Tara, thank you for listening. I see that you're on the phone and thank you for texting me. We will be sending you that JOT form via email. And um, so don't worry about that. Thank you for telling me though, I appreciate that. So if one person completed their form, And we have another person who's completed their form or just waiting on, on a few other people. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you again.
So if you've just joined us, because I think someone has just joined us, the, uh, there is a link in the chat box that you need to fill out the JOT form. Just click on that link and answer the questions. Okay, we have a few more to go. Thank you. Thank you, and we're just waiting for one more person. Beautiful. All right, we have everyone who's called for, and the um, uh, we'll take care of the other person. So now I can introduce our wonderful instructor, and her name is, Rochelle Amy. Rochelle Amy has an impressive uh, professional career in education, and she has been engaged in education student development since the, since the year 2000 in different settings such as university, K-12, and adult education. Rochelle Amy's focus is on the nonprofit sector uh, in administrative marketing and communications. She's an amazing instructor in essential skills, and has been with Workplace Education Manitoba since 2019. And right now she works at the Interlake West Center. On a personal note, and to further add value to her students and to the webinar today, she went back to school recently, and I'm so very proud of her, um, to get her master's degree in leadership. So congratulations, Rochelle. And I'm so very excited to, um, to invite you here today to instruct us. So if you have a moment, everybody just go right up to the emojis and give her a round of applause. And I'm so excited to learn from you. Um, Rochelle, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Great to have you all with us today. Uh, what a great uh, intro. Thank you, Jessica, for saying that. But what none of you would know about me are what some of my very first jobs were in customer service. And because I did them and they were a challenge, I'm so jazzed about this topic. I talk about it all the time. And in fact, my husband said to me recently, wow, 25 years of talking about customer service. Hey, <laughs> so I guess I do talk about this one. <laughs> I just want to give you the emoji and tell you I'm so thankful you would sign up and join in. Whether you're joining because you're representing your own career and where you're at in wanting to strengthen your skills, or if you're in leadership and customer service and you want to gather tools, check out what we're teaching so that you know how to equip your staff. In either scenario, you deserve the applause for joining us and being willing to take this journey of learning together. This is who Workplace Education Manitoba is. We're all about equipping people with essential skills that help them in their work, their learning, and their life. We can't do it on our own. We're funded and by different levels of government, and so we're really grateful for that and want to take a second just to mention that and thank the people who funded this program for us. It's a pretty awesome opportunity. You did get to see Jessica and of course you've met me now and what you may or may not know is that we have a classroom and there's a classroom um, in this case the photos of one in Selkirk but we're actually all over Manitoba. We call them West Centers and that just stands for Workplace Education Skills Training and uh, you can come do one-on-one -on -one small group work. Uh, sometimes we host workshops there and you can join us at our various West Centers. 
And because our vision really reaches the whole province, we're not Winnipeg specific or Selkirk specific, et cetera. We're really about all Manitobans. And because of that, we have a reach quite a, quite a ways across the province where we focus on these nine essential skills. And today we really sort of highlight three of them that come out really, really strong in customer service. Uh, but every, anywhere you are, in Manitoba, we probably have a classroom near you. <laughs> and so this is actually a snapshot of where they are. And so hopefully they're in a region near you and you'd be able to visit us sometime at one of those places. I would love to know though, because we've gathered online, I don't know where all of you are from. So could you use a chat if you're comfortable sharing the town or the city that you're in? Uh, you're not required to share, but if you would, just tell us where you're from today. And it gives us a snapshot where a handful of you are joining in from, thanks to the wonders of technology. All over Manitoba. This is awesome. I love it. All great towns. I think I've been to all those towns so far. So that's pretty sweet. I love it. Well, we're glad you could use technology to virtually come to Selkirk and be with me here today. I'm <laughs> really, really glad to have you. It's funny because in the customer service industry, like saying customer service is kind of like saying a job. It's so broad. It can mean so many things, right? And so you would have applied for a job um, to enter that industry. And your education, your experience, your skills, those probably opened that door for you. Hopefully not just someone you knew, but some of your own skills and aptitudes. And then the whole idea of your strengths, your character, what you bring to table to the table in your own character, hopefully that's what's going to actually help you keep that job and succeed and maybe even get promoted and work your ways through. My very first job ever, I wasn't even quite 16 yet, I was 14 or 15, I don't know, and I got a job serving coffee at a super busy restaurant. So it was a huge, huge restaurant. It was the place to be at that time. And they, believe it or not, had someone dedicated to just serving coffee and we had a timer set. So every seven minutes, my timer would go off and I was expected to have made the fresh coffee within that window and circulated through the entire restaurant refilling everybody's cups. And some days you would almost run to try to get back to that timer <laughs> in seven minutes. From there, I, you know, I did lots of different jobs as a teenager and so on. And one job that I had that really sticks out for me with customer service is I sold shoes at Sears. And here's the thing. Back in the day, you know, you could probably guess my age when I tell you what my shoe sales job was like. <laughs> Back in the day, you didn't just go buy shoes and ask them for a pair of shoes and try them on. Actually, what you did is you would ask for the size you wanted and when they brought it out we would unpack the box we'd open it up the shoes would be perfectly wrapped in their tissue and we would open them up and undo laces or buckles and we would get down on our knee and put the shoe on the customer so the customer had zero work to do except to stick their stinky swollen foot into the shoe so you could imagine the level of customer service training that I went through where I realized real quick this isn't just about selling something this is about engaging with customers and what nobody could see is that when people didn't know their shoe size, they would try something on, they'd, they'd say, oh, I asked for a 10, but maybe I'll try the nine and a half, and you'd go get it, you'd come back, and then they'd go, oh no, maybe I'll try the 10 and a half, and so then you'd take it back and bring it back. What nobody knew was that our back room was so jam-packed full of shoes that we had two sets of staircases to climb to go to these different areas to get all the shoes. So every time you went back there, you were climbing one or two floors to get up to the stock to bring it for people. 
So you find out real quick that this isn't about how to use the calculator, this isn't about how to use a cash register, or what line you're supposed to say to upsell. You find out right away this is how to uh, refine yourself and your own attitude so that you can represent the company really, really well. Well, I love this quote by Jonah Sachs, and it talks about, it's, it's directed to companies, not necessarily individuals, but he talks about how your whole brand, your whole image, your whole messaging, it really is something that unfolds in every place that the customer interacts with you. So that could be online, that could be in person, that could be with your first point of contact, no matter who it is, or even after they've received the product or the service, your brand is still unfolding based on all the different touch points that someone's had. And yet when we think of customer service, how often do we just think it's us and the customer? That's just two people involved. And yet those two people involved really represent four major relationships that are at play. So it's not just about you and the frontline service or the need that needs to be met, it's really who were you that walked into work that day? Who are you in relationship to your coworkers and let's say the team that you represent? And then from there, it's that bigger thing that you spent those first few days on the job in orientation, learning all about the company. That's like level three of where you're at, ready to interact with a customer. And then level four is the actual in-person or virtual connection with the customer themselves gets pretty complicated when we realize you cannot do number four well if you have not evaluated, learned, and mastered those first three relationships. So the way we're gonna sort of break things down in our time together is today we're gonna go through relationships one to three to three, and we're gonna have a good sense of who we are in context of our environment and our team, and what we bring to the table as individuals, because what we bring, our contributions are all different, different skills and talents, and then different components of character that can really strengthen the company's brand. And then in our next session together, we're gonna get real specific about relationship with the customer, what that looks like, interaction, dealing with conflict, and all those great, exciting topics of dealing with a customer can be so complicated. Well, it's so important to do it because look at the statistics. If somebody's happy with the service they received, just one little cup of coffee, if they are happy with that cup of coffee, there's a huge chance that they're going to return to that company or even recommend the company based on those touch points they had with the product and the people. The product's never enough. The people always deliver it. And this is the amazing statistic. That number skyrockets even higher if their experience was bad. So even just this morning, I, I mentioned to Jessica, before I even joined you today, I as a customer had to dial in to a government agency to get something dealt with in, in paperwork. And the experience I had was not terrific. And so I would probably be one of these 91% that would be like, ah, I'm just not gonna shop there anymore. Of course, in some cases, like say your MPI insurance or something like that, you have no choice. You have to use that brand or that office. But I'm going to bet that most of you represent private companies and organizations where customers do have a choice. And if they have a bad experience with your receptionist or someone on the floor or whatever, there's a 91, it's just a staggering statistic, a 91% chance that they're just not even gonna to wanna to come back. So really it's about building that trust in knowing that we have not only the aptitude, the resources and the supplies we need to make something happen, but that our human resources are so well stocked. So like I said, with those four relationships, digging into the first three today and saving that one with the external customer for our next session, we're gonna dig right in to personal management. This is probably the hardest one to train your staff on. And if you're the frontline person who just got the job, 
this is probably the one that's the hardest for them to talk to you about. So this takes self-governance to be able to make this happen. In your notebook, you do have a place where you can unpack what does self-trust mean to me? What does self-awareness mean to me? What do I think she's going to say about personal presentation? And, and that's actually a great tool for you to use with your coworkers and if you're a supervisor with the ones you supervise. Because not only will you harvest more information, but you'll find out the starting point that everyone has. What's their starting point on what they what they think those things mean. So digging in and saying, what does it mean to me personally, becomes very rich because it means something to you based on where you've been and what you've accomplished. Some of the questions you can explore about what that looks like with self-trust are really the things that, can I depend on myself to do this? Can I get up when I'm supposed to get up? Or does the bed have control over me? Do I challenge myself to do anything hard or new? Have I overcome adversity in any way? Because you know the adversities you've overcome are become these huge, huge strengths where you know, hey, I climbed that mountain once, I can climb that mountain again. Um, and you know, even the challenges, often we get lost thinking just about the workplace. But I had a friend who's a really high level baseball player challenge me last year and say, you know, have you picked a sport that you just want to try and learn? And I was like, gosh, I'm never going to be able to play baseball the way they do. <laughs> but I got an idea. I thought, I know a sport where I can take lessons. I can work at my own pace. I'm going to give it a try. So I signed up for golf lessons. I'm in them right now. I'm learning how to play golf. And I'm the customer in that situation. And I'm doing something hard. I don't find golf easy. It's not coming to me intuitively. Are any of you golfers? Can you give me an emoji if you're a golfer so that you under I know you understand the sport <laughs> and you know so you know what it felt like when you first learned, right? <laughs> and so thank you. I feel I feel known that you can relate. Um, so sometimes building that self-trust to know what am I capable of? Can I count on myself to show up? Can I do it? Sometimes that's being creative even outside the workplace and trying things that are new, learning languages, learning hobbies, learning how to do things. What's your internal voice that you get? Um, and have you re-scripted it in any way? And what are those internal motivations? Why are you working? Are you working because you need to work? You need the paycheck? Are you working because you're working in a family business and they really need you to be there? Are you working to get away from your kids? You know, what are all the motivations on why you're working? Or are you a higher level worker where you're working because you found fulfillment and you realize you're making a difference in that industry that you're a part of? Knowing those things and being able to articulate them is a big key in being able to serve a customer. Because see, the customer might see something about you. They might see you in that uniform you represent, but only you can actually see inside on why you're there, what's motivating you, what you need, what your big dreams are. And you know, one thing I loved doing, I was in a higher level leadership position in one organization, but I had lots of frontline staff. And in that case, it involved the food industry. And so for my job, I had to dress up. I had to you know, wear a suit jacket and look all professional because I had to go deal with clients and, and different meetings and things. But my frontline staff had to wear the apron and the kitchen scrubs and the hairnet. And I loved putting that on and watching what would happen. Because when I went and put on the frontline clothing and dealt with the customers like that, they treated me differently than when I was dressed in a different way. And so it's important to have a good sense of what your self-trust is and why you're doing the job you're doing. Otherwise, they're gonna throw you off kilter when you're dealing with a customer and they think you're either too high or too low in the organization to relate to them. So this is a real key piece in understanding yourself. And if you want to build that self-trust, this is something just like with golf lessons I'm doing. You know, I'm committing to something and keeping that commitment. So for eight weeks, I have to show up at my lessons all the time and there's homework to do in between and practicing in between. What's the thing you could commit to? 
just to flex that self-trust muscle. Could you decide that for the next three days you're going to get up a half an hour earlier than you normally do? Or could you, whatever, I, I don't care what your habit is and it's totally personal, I don't want you to share it, um, but is there a piece, and it could even be something like answering all your emails for a day, uh, but is there something you could commit to and say, hey, for the next three days, I'm going to do that to strengthen that self-trust muscle, because really the key in customer service is self-confidence, right? It's the person knowing, hey, I know the product, I know how to serve you, I know what to do, and it's the behind the scenes piece that I've also prepared and done some, some self preparation so that I'm in a position that I can help someone else. Now building the self trust pieces comes out of that place of self awareness. Now show me an emoji if you've been around a crazy toddler. Has anyone been in an experience where you've been with a crazy toddler? Probably it happened in Walmart. <laughs> Maybe it happened in your own living room. Maybe it's every time you go to that family gathering, there's that crazy toddler. And the funny thing about toddlers is they're the best example of the lack of self-awareness. <laughs> they don't know anyone else is in the room. They just walk in and they want what they want and they say what they say and they play with the toy they want to play with because there's no one else in the room. It's just them. <laughs> So having a self-awareness where you recognize, I am aware of my character, my feelings, my motives and desires, that puts us in a place where we know how to not rub the people around us the wrong way. So one of the very first things that we encounter with self-awareness is triggers. We just need to know, you know, like if, say my, my job about serving the coffee every seven minutes, I'll probably never forget that job. Um, you know, this coffee ticked me off. It's funny, I don't even drink coffee at all. So now, you know, does that tick me off if someone asks me to pour them a cup of coffee? Does that does that do anything to me? Or if they call me a certain name or, or treat me a certain way, do I know what those buttons are that might get pushed if I happen to interact with a customer? Do I know what my needs are? So do I know that, hey, I'm on commission. I really need to make this sale. So I'm feeling all the pressure on this. Am I aware? Am I self-aware of why there's so much riding on me about that, that service piece that's about to happen with the customer? Am I aware of where I've come from or where I am at the moment and any kind of biases that I might bring in to the equation? And, and people want to jump right away to race when they talk about culture and biases. But don't just jump there. That's sort of the easy route. Um, there's other biases that can come at play, even with what you think the person wants. Sometimes you get a bias when the person says, I'm here to buy the cheapest hot tub you have. I just want the cheapest one. Don't talk to me about anything else. Sometimes you could come up with a bias based on how much you think the customer is even willing to spend. Now we go deep into this self-awareness piece and people start going, wait a sec, I thought I, I, I thought I signed up to help customers. Why do I have to look at myself? <laughs> well, think about what happens when you receive poor customer service. What if, you know, going back to that cup of coffee that makes the 82% difference, what about that moment that you order the cup of coffee and the person's just really unkind to you and it's not a great experience when you dig in and find empathy and grace what do you end up saying oh I guess they're having a bad day or you say to your friend or your child or your coworker, you're like I guess their dog died today let's just give them a break right do you cut people slack give me an emoji if you know how to cut people slack and you invent the excuse in your mind or sometimes you can see it right if you've ever been to the Red River X you know why the people working there aren't that happy. You can see all the swarms of customers around them making their life miserable. <laughs> so you know how to cut someone slack. So that's really why you have to do the self-awareness piece with yourself because you're expecting other people to give you something that maybe you haven't even done yourself. Knowing what's happened that brought you to that moment with the customer or brought you to your work day. You know, if you show up for work at 8 a.m., what happened before 8 a.m.? 
And I remember working with a coworker once and, you know, lovely, lovely gal, but she made this interesting comment about how rough her morning was. And I was like, oh no, what happened? Like, this is 8 a.m., what happened to you this morning? And she's like, oh, my mom forgot to make the coffee today. And my mom makes me my coffee every day and puts it in the travel mug for me. And my dad warms up the car and then I come to work and they both didn't do that today. So I had to make my own coffee and warm up my own car. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have to pause and laugh for a second. <laughs> I was like thinking in my head, I, you know, I, I did, I kept it together and I expressed empathy. Because I had a little bit of self-awareness that I knew my emotions were riding high that morning. I had been up since 6 a.m. I was dealing with kids who didn't want to go to school. I forgot to eat breakfast. I had so much going on before I walked in that door that the least of my worries were whether someone had made me my coffee in a travel mug or not. So take that to a higher level. When you're in any kind of crisis, you know, you're taking care of a family member who's sick or you have emotion that you're supercharged with because your boss just dumped a huge deadline on you. Knowing what those pieces are puts you in a position to help someone down the road. Physical barriers can be huge. When I watch the real physical demanding jobs, I watched someone doing construction on the street here in my town the other day, and they were holding this huge, huge saw that could cut concrete. And it was so hot and muggy yesterday. It was just like the hottest day. And I go by this person, they're carrying this thing, it's like two feet wide. I can only imagine that it weighs 100 pounds. It looked massive. And they're bent over doing this backbreaking work cutting out a concrete curb <laughs> I thought man if that person I don't know how physically they did that in that heat yesterday but I thought on top of that if they had any physical barrier coming into work if they were recovering from anything that had happened to their body that's huge then when the customer walks by and wants to interact with them and then do you know your own tone and vocabulary? Do you know your own resting face? You know, do you know what you look and sound like when you innocently don't mean anything negative, but how could people interpret that? Well, today, diversity and understanding who you are sort of go hand in hand because you don't necessarily know where the customer or the colleague is coming from and what their points of reference are. And in your notes, um, there is a note about today's diverse workforce and how the latest formal immigration stats that we can gather are from 2016, but a lot's happened even since 2016. Um, but in those formally reported statistics, it's interesting because the labor force is going up hugely by those who are coming from other cultures, experiences, and languages, and what's normal to them in a workplace could look different from what you think. So you're going to encounter this on your actual team, and you're going to encounter this with customers, recognizing, hey, where am I coming from? What's my vantage point? And where could I imagine they might be coming from? And just fun facts, you know, the top source countries in order were Philippines, India, Eritrea, Syria, China, and Israel. Those were the top six. And then you've got the list in your notes of the others. And so if I just asked you randomly, hey, what do you know about the culture in Eritrea? What could you tell me about that? What language do they speak? How do they treat each other? What's considered a greeting and a custom for that? We'd have to do our research to learn that for all 12 of the countries listed. So understanding what is regular or routine for me and what I might be communicating is just gonna take us into like a supersonic speed of understanding with our customer. There's a whole host of benefits that can come, come forward from doing this, but the benefits usually only come if we do this one first. <laughs> so there is a place in your in your workbook. Now, I'm not going to force you to do your homework. You're all grown-ups. <laughs> That's the great thing about gathering today is, uh, you know, you're self-motivated to be here. And if you wanted to take time and go through your handout, I think it would strengthen um, so much of what you could offer and bring to the table in your own service, your own career and also with those that you train and that you bring up in the whole service industry. So there is a section 
to just sort of dig into those blind spots and look and look at what that looks like. I'm just going to pause for just a second and let you just do a quick read through and get a sense of what the questions are. And I'm not going to ask you for your answers, but just give you a second to take a peek. So I think what works kind of well with that exercise is the other one in your workbook where you get to um, outline, hey, not only what are some of those blind spots, but um, what are the opportunities of what could happen or what are the benefits? Now, some of you, um, I just recognize that some of you might be joining us by telephone and um, not looking at a computer screen. And if that's the case, um, I just wanted to let you know that the handout was emailed to you. And so mostly what you're getting in the slides that we're seeing visually, you're going to be able to refer back to in your workbook. Um, sort of not word for word, but certainly these experiences that we're talking about where you can jot down what your various blind spots are. And if you are on the phone, um, just to give you an idea, some of the blind spots that we're looking at up on the screen, um, it just sort of talks about impatience um, with people maybe who are different ages or come from different backgrounds or have different definitions of what they think appropriate personal space is. And so it's just looking at those kinds of blind spots to get an idea, hey, once I recognize where I'm coming from, then I can recognize what those benefits are that come from working in a diverse workforce. And then the last one, and if you're, um, you know, if you've had to train a coworker on on dealing with people, you know this is the hardest one to talk about. It's usually in the company manual, and usually the people who need to hear this think they already get it. But we're going to just talk about it today because it's the kind of thing where we really have to look in the mirror and figure out, you know, what works. I love this ex this example. Um, this screen for me just refreshes based on something that just happened to me this weekend. For those of you joining by phone, one of the images on the screen is a baseball player. He's in a baseball uniform and he's covered in dirt. Maybe he's already slid into a base and so he's just covered in that kind of dirt. And it just sort of reminds me about being dressed appropriately for the task at hand. I was headed to um, a baseball practice and my lovely husband said to me, are you wearing that? That's what you're wearing for baseball? And then I sort of rethought it and realized I, I just kept on the clothes I was wearing from work. And so I was totally overdressed for where we were going. And I would not be helpful in the whole baseball practice. So I had to rejig and rethink my preparation for going into that environment. And maybe if you wear multiple hats and you're in different teams, different workplaces, that looks different. What you wear and how you represent and what's appropriate, that looks different in all those different spaces. So there's room for you in your notebook to jot down some of the aspects of being clean. Um, it shouldn't be overlooked that deodorant is a thing. And that doesn't just mean deodorant that you apply to your body. That's the whole idea of deodorizing. So, you know, if you're a smoker, are you still smoking when you walk through the door? Sometimes maybe you've had the smoke, you butted it out, and as you walk through the door, you're exhaling the smoke. There's a whole host of things about the odor that you present or, you know, if you work in a workplace where it's specific to chemicals or deep fryers or things like that and then you left that workplace and went into another workplace there would be aspects about smell to think about and it's kind of huge um, for customers they really pick up on smell and odors how you present in what you're wearing 
um, your presentation with hair and fingernails, how much you have on. You know, if you're all cluttery, let's say you wear jewelry and you have rings on every finger, and yet your job is to serve coffee, that's very not good with the health inspector and customers don't particularly appreciate that. So even adornments like jewelry and nail polish and so on can be a thing. Oral care is huge in dealing with customers because often if there's any kind of um, communication barrier, when it comes to the words you're using, the accent you might have, or how you enunciate, sometimes if you have a different speech impediment where you pronounce certain letters differently, people tend to not look at your eyes and start to focus on your mouth and try to do some lip reading. So oral care is actually a thing that matters in customer service. And then of course your companies would have their own standards on, on on the cleanliness once you're there, right? Using the, the washrooms, how to deal with injuries and so on. In that caring, um, this is the part where, you know, we're talking about personal presentation. How do I present to the customer? So how I present myself and my own cleanliness is one thing. And then how do I present a caring attitude? That's mostly to do with etiquette. And etiquette isn't intuitive because what works for you in your household may not be the thing that works in the place of employment. So being mindful about how you're welcoming, if you're welcoming, you might say welcome here and it might not sound like that at all based on your tone and your body language. Um, the type of language you're using, is it fit for that environment? Your manners, your courtesies, opening doors for people, offering seats is huge. You should always be the person, I don't care where you are on the company totem pole, you should always be the person counting how many people are in the room. And if you've called a meeting and 12 people show up at a table where there's 11 seats, you be the one to get up and find that seat. That's customer service for whatever type of customer you're working with. And being professional, you know, how you carry yourself and that whole idea of posture, confidence, and the stance that you take, this ties into that self-trust and that self-awareness, right? Because we know if we have a good understanding of where we're coming from, then we know how to either overcome that or leverage that in a way that lets our body communicate the right level of professionalism. Now, this section here about trust with coworkers, this is one that we often want to fast forward over because we don't think of the coworker as our customer, but it's actually so tied in with the experience that a customer is going to experience in your company that this is the one I think people overlook probably the most and don't recognize that when they don't have a trust with their coworker, they think the customer doesn't know, but the customer almost always knows. If it's in person, you can tell. And if it's about supply chain, you find out really quick whether that team knows how to work or not. So we've got this in your workbook to let you think about what are customers in my organization. And another phrase that you might hear professionally is stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? So there's this whole idea of you have internal customers and you have external customers. The external customers, pretty easy to identify. There's somebody who doesn't have much of a relationship with your company or your product or your services, but they've come to you to be a consumer. But internally, that can look very different. You can have customers who are very much a part of the company, or they're a part of the sister group of companies, or they've been referred by one of the service personnel consulting to your company, and it might be the person that you're on shift with. Well, it's so important to recognize that internal friction leads to external friction. You cannot hide it, even if you're behind closed doors. What ends up happening is that those who are unhappy internally about what's happening in their team, it just ends up being passed down the line to the customer. You can't get away from it. So when we understand that we don't just use the word team, we don't just use the word you know company morale, we don't just throw those around as buzzwords. It's actually recognizing I'm a big piece of a pie that makes up the whole company picture. 
And when we look a little closer at what that looks like in being a teammate, there's really three attributes that come right to the top. They just rise to the top as what everybody says they want in a teammate and in a team member. They want your strong character, they want you to be adaptable, and they want you to be dependable. It's interesting because so does your customer. These are things that a customer looks for. But when we read surveys and research about what team members want, these are what rise to the top. And when we think about character, it really gets summed up in your integrity, your honesty, loyalty, self-sacrifice, accountability, and self-control. I remember another job I had as a young person, and it was at a time when security cameras were just being implemented on the workers. It used to always be that security cameras were on customers in case they were shoplifting. But this time, labor laws and things were changing, and they were able to put a lot of the workers on camera. So we had to do all this training about knowing when you're on camera and what they're watching for. And this is what it came down to. They realized we have to put cameras on our employees who are handling all the money because we can't count on all these character pieces. So this is what people want from you in a team. Adaptability, this to me is the biggest buzzword of our time that actually has meat to it. Solving problems and adapting to change is the key piece in moving forward in what's ahead in our workplaces. And then of course, dependability, being the one that people can count on, being the one that shares responsibility, that helps pull the load. In that whole realm of character, um, go ahead and look up the word integrity. There's even room in your, in your notes to be able to write what integrity is. And look up the Merriam-Webster dictionary version of that. It's a good exercise to do. And one of the phrases one of my professors said to me that I like is, integrity is who you are when no one's looking. And so do you pick up the trash that's on the ground in the reception area when the boss is standing there? And do you pick it up? when nobody's watching, that you're the one who's picking it up, even though it's not your job. That's integrity. Adaptability is being the person who doesn't say this, you want me to do what? <laughs> it's being able to use critical thinking skills and assess the situation. And this just happened to me just a week ago. Um, I took my kids to the golf course. They wanted to do the driving range. Now I know I told you I'm in golf lessons and I'm supposed to be practicing, but I had a deadline. So I had brought work along and I had to do some work. So I said, you guys, you do the driving range. I'm going to be right here and I just have to finish the report I'm working on. So I go to find a chair outside. Do you think I could find a chair? No, because of the whole COVID restrictions, they decided someone could only sit in a chair if a certain person put a chair somewhere, and then that same person was the one to wash it down, because washing down the chair was in that person's job description. So here I am standing there, there's three staff members, there's all kinds of chairs, and I say, could I just use a chair for a little while? And no, well, I, I don't know, no, one, no one's ever asked to sit there while well, someone's at the driving range. I, I, I don't know. We only have people sit here for this other purpose. And I was like, well, if you don't mind, like I'll wash the chair down, I'll disinfect it. I, I just want to be able to sit and do this report. And the guy says to me, well, the person who actually wipes down the chairs for COVID, like they're not here right now. So I don't know who else would wipe that down. So no, maybe just don't sit. So. You know, I really respect that they're following guidelines that were outlined for them. But what it showed me is the whole concept of adaptability. Um, they're sometimes we're so tied to a policy, we're not able to adapt and recognize, oh, someone needs to sit down. And if I need to disinfect the chair, I will disinfect the chair, even though that's not in my job description or I'll help the customer or whatever. Now, I worked around it. I found a place to go sit and let the mosquitoes eat me. It was wonderful. But um, this is just sort of a snapshot of a really goofy, unusual situation. Why should someone be wanting to sit where the chairs are at the golf course when someone's on the driving range? Like, you know, it's something outside of the box. So going ahead and digging into what adaptability looks like for you, it leads to the dependability piece.
And in your, in your handout today, you have lots of homework on dependability because this is something that I think you could share with your coworkers and your employees. There's even one website on there that takes people through lessons, of lesson after lesson, of how to problem solve and how to think about being dependable and how to use critical thinking skills in a way that strengthens them in their workplace. So spend as much time as you want on that or as little time as you want on that. I'm not going to force you to do any of it, but I will ask you about it in our next session together. I'd love to hear um, on some of these different exercises what you were able to do. And spoiler alert, what I'm about to talk about next is actually the homework that I really, really encourage you to do and be able to share with us the next time that we gather. It's taking us into this concept of who do I work for? What company do I work for? What are the values? What are the needs? Do I have genuine care? Do I have genuine trust? And have I been trained in all of the company's necessary values? So if I were to ask you who you work for, and I'm not going to make you disclose that in our chat because I do want to respect your privacy that you're representing your employers from across the province. But if I asked who do you work for, you'd probably really be able quickly to give me the legal name of the entity you work for. In this hour that we're spending together, I work for Workplace Education Manitoba. Boom, easy to say, obviously I know the company. But who is that exactly? If I asked you to unpack, what is it? What is their ethos? What does that look like? Some people would lean more towards describing I work for my boss, I love my boss, I'm day to day, eight hours a day, this is the person that I'm with, and that's who I'm loyal to. I'm not loyal to the name of the company or the brand, I'm loyal to the person. And actually, if you're in a place of leadership, um, that's just something to note, you know, they say most people don't leave bad jobs, they leave bad managers. So that relationship's so key. A lot of people really only work for the company as much as they're engaged with you. Others work for the brand. I have a cousin who worked for Starbucks for years because she loves the brand of Starbucks. So she didn't care who she worked with, what location she was at. She just loved that she got her free pound of coffee every week. She loved being a part of the whole vibe, the brand. She was infinitely loyal because of the Starbucks brand. So you might think that's who you work for. And then some others maybe are loyal to the big picture. Maybe you love who the actual big boss is, or maybe you love that your company is the lead in the industry, and so you love being able to say that you work for the lead influencer in the industry of XYZ. So sort of taking a bit of time to do some digger deeping on, di deeper digging on who it is you actually work for, you personally, how you're motivated and what you understand in these three levels of loyalty is so key in being able to offer something to a customer. What is ethos? What is it? I think it really, you know, you can see on the slide for those of us joining by phone, like when we think of what our company is all about, sometimes we can rattle off training tidbits, sometimes we can rattle off policies. We might know what our current realities are. We might know what customers think of us. And we might know what our company is really, really good at and how we're better than the competition in some way or another. Well, that's fine. Those are practical things. Those are, those are truths. But there's one more piece. It's really, what's the ethos in that company? What is that one thing? What is really the culture, the spirit, the vibe that the company gives off? What is that one thing? And it's funny because ethos isn't usually told to you. It's something that you usually experience and start to figure out the longer that you're there, you go, Oh, the company says this is what we do, this is the service we provide, but really what makes us unique, what really gives us our place in the market is actually that ethos, that intangible, not really written down thing that happens based on who we are as a collective. So, in your handbook, I encourage you to do two things. I encourage you to put in your own words, What's your company's mission statement, values, and goals? What are those? I'm not asking you to put them in your own words because I think you're going to be wrong. 
I'm asking you to put them in your own words because it's going to show you the ethos that you're experiencing and believing about the company you work for. And if you're experiencing and believing that, there's a high chance that that's the impression and the understanding that customers have. If we think about what our perceived value statements are about companies and what the real one is, I would say about McDonald's in pink there, I, I say my mission statement for them is to be cheap and consistent. That's what I think they're trying to do based on my experience there. And then you can see actually they have a mission to be the customer's favorite way to eat and to drink. Same as Tim Hortons. If I try to think based on my experience there, what is it I think they do? I think they want to give people fast coffee. They're all about a drive through thing. And then when I read their mission statement, I see they're trying to do the highest quality products and services. And then I think, yeah, I guess that's kind of true because they keep innovating with all these funky donuts and different products they keep trying to bring out. They're trying to do more than just the coffee. And, and Cadillac too. You know, when I think of a Cadillac, luxury sedan comes to mind. There's a certain vibe they're trying to do. And it's so cool to read their mission statement because I'm like, I think their ethos is about quality. I think their ethos is about integrity, that every Cadillac vehicle looks or feels like something. And then sure enough, it shows up in the mission statement. So doing that little bit of work about your own company, what you think the ethos is, like the real vibe, spirit, feeling of it, the real critical characteristics that separate it from the competition, put that in your own words. And recognize that knowing that and being able to convey that is the key to customer service. Because all of us, no matter where we are, whether we're frontline, answering the phone, managing, leading, we're all basically in the sales area. So in your notebook there, um, in addition to asking you about writing out ethos in your own words, a little later on, it also asks you, now write out the actual company mission. So find out the vision statement, the mission statement, and then I'm going to ask you for those next time and just see, were there any um, different wording pieces? Were you able to put something into your own words and identify something that looked a little different than what they had written in their mission statement? And then you get to see, you can still reach and execute a mission statement, but then there's a whole personality and characteristic that happens about that company. And that's like putting the self-awareness piece into the company, right? Recognizing that it's more than just the luxury sedan that's quality and integrity, but there's also a feeling that happens. And there's also these values that happen in how we treat each other and in how we treat different customers. So that brings us to a conclusion for our session one today. And this gives you a picture of where we'll go in our next session. We're really going to tackle into those dealing with the customers, those interactions that happen, the skills that we need and ways we can address conflict. And there's even some steps, you know, do this one, two, three, four, and it walks you through some of the conflicts and challenges and opportunities. Thank you for joining us today. And I turn it over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Rochelle. I really appreciate you and your information. Um, when we look at uh, customer service, we, we look at just serving the client. But in today's uh, workshop, you've also brought in a lot of different things that um, we didn't even think of. So thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, part two as well. I'd like to thank, of course, the participants for joining us today, as well as completing the JOT form. And um, also, I'd like to thank Rochelle Amy for being here today. She's an amazing instructor, so please give her a round of applause. She continues to add value to our webinars, and we keep asking her back over and over again, because even if she's presenting the same information, that we get value uh, each time that she uh, presents. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you very soon in the next webinar. Goodbye.